Okay. It, can you all hear me if I do this? Yeah. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. So if that is a problem, I will get back on the mic, but I think I'll try to leave this here for now. Uh, all right. Maybe I will just leave it here. All right. Okay. So um, welcome. Thank you all for being here, and um, I really look forward to this discussion, as I've said when I've been um, here with groups before, and really any other type of a forum like this, I really like having a two-way conversation. So um, I'll just take a few minutes to talk a bit about how things are going, what I'm doing, why I'm here, uh, and then I'd like to really open it up to hear from, from you all, and uh, especially to hear about what is the most concerning, what is the most interesting topic, what, what are the things that you're prioritizing, what you're looking for um, in a candidate, because a, a major part of what I'm doing here is, is making myself available to you as a choice, and I'm looking for, um, I'm, I'm hoping to earn your support and, and your willingness to nominate me again. Um, and thank you for your introduction. It was amazing, uh, as it was last time. So thank you. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't really have anything else to add or modify. It, it, she's got it exactly right. I uh, am at, I'm at Tucson Medical Center, and um, that is something uh, that uh, it's actually our largest hospital in Southern Arizona, and it's a place where I get to meet a lot of people, and that is honestly why I am here in this capacity. Because uh, the last time I was um, uh, here about. I think April or May of last year, discussing the importance of not getting rid of the Affordable Care Act because it helps so many people. Um, and thankfully, for the most part, we, we haven't, um, uh, thank goodness. And thanks to John McCain, by the way, for the thumbs down. That was very helpful. Uh, we don't always agree. We regularly don't agree, frankly, in terms of my opinions with uh, John McCain, but that was a really important thing that he did for us. Um, but seeing patients in the ER, admitting them to the hospital, uh, this is not something that just involves symptoms, fevers, chest pain, nausea. Yeah, okay, that's a lot of what I do. But what you learn from people is um, whose kid is out of work and sleeping on the living room sofa. You learn you know, whose home just got foreclosed on and who's now homeless. You learn all these things, people who can't afford their medications because they don't have health insurance. All of these things really come into play when we're trying to work on your behalf if you're a patient in the hospital. And so all of that really came, um, in my head at least, it really came forward as I just kind of thought about um, what I should be doing. And I heard from patient after patient after patient who remembered me from the ads and from, from being on the ballot last time who did not like the leadership of Martha McSally at the time, who um, continued to be distressed at the occupant of the White House, at Donald Trump and, and the kind of things he's doing, um, when you can figure that out, um, <laughs> and who just said time and time again, hundreds of patients and colleagues, not just Democratic folks, I don't know, I don't really ask patients or my colleagues about their political leanings, but, but people who I know to be more conservative coming up to me and saying, look, um, you did this already, people know who you are a bit, you've got to get in there. We can't have this. You know, DC isn't working for us, it's not working for anyone. So get in there and, and please do this again. And after about five or six months of hearing that kind of encouragement, I said, you know, that's a really good point. Um, all the time and effort and stress I put my parents through. Um, my parents, if I haven't told you before, are very, very conservative Republicans. So, yeah. But they love me. So they, 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 they've donated. They very. They still love me. They, they very generously donated. Uh, you know, quite generously to my, to my campaign. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, they do like to make jokes, though. They, they say it's because they dropped me as a baby or something. So, and, you know, like it's, it's very cute. But um, no, they, they of course love and support me. Me. They'll give me money, but they're not sure they're going to vote for me. Like, <laughs> actually, they're registered in Michigan right now. They're, they do Oro Valley and then Michigan for seven months of the year, so they couldn't vote in Arizona. Um, so, uh, but no, I, I thought, you know, this does make sense. I did, did this for 18 months last time, had some really great conversations with thousands of people across southern Arizona, and um, I love this. I can't think of more of an honor than to be representing you and working on your behalf in DC and doing what I did kind of like when I was in the legislature because it's it's difficult as you can tell getting a lot uh, getting a law passed it's very difficult sometimes even when everyone agrees on it like should we let the 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 
the children, who at the time were children, who are now adults, those DACA or Dreamers, uh, should we let them stay? Of course. 80 plus, 85 percent of the country say that. Um, 70 plus percent of the Congress, Senate and House say that, and yet it still isn't happening, right? And this just lets you know you really need to have an understanding of the process and an ability to work with people that don't necessarily agree with you, but it's so important to be able to preserve your, your values. And, and I think that I've done that for the four years I was in the legislature, working with Jan Brewer, not the most progressive person, um, our, our, our former governor, right? But still I got uh, over a dozen bills through to help women afford breast cancer treatment, um, cervical cancer treatment, who didn't have any type of coverage. That was a program that cost millions of dollars, and yet a bipartisan coalition came together and supported it. That's the kind of thing that we need to have happen in Washington, D.C., too. And so um, I think with that kind of experience and background, I think I've, I've shown that I can, I can do that kind of advocacy and, yes, have meetings with people that maybe don't agree with me and come to some kind of consensus so that we have something, so we move forward a little bit on an issue, even if it's not as much as I would prefer or many of you would prefer. So, um, yeah, I think having that respectful conversation is something that we really lack right now in D.C., and we need to get it back. So um, that is my commitment to treat people fairly, to, to converse with them respectfully, to never, ever abandon my progressive values, which I never did in this legislature, and I will not do in D.C. if you nominate me. So um, with that, I'm going to stop rambling at you all and ask you to uh, please let me know what is most important to you, why it's most important to you, and just um, you know, let fly with some questions, and I will try to succinctly answer them. And if I'm not, I will count on someone up here just kind of you know, poking me with a stick or something. So how's that? You all right? Anyone? OK, we'll start right up here. How would you uh, woo the military contingent here in, this, in southern Arizona? Mm. Great question. So we have, of course, a ton of folks who serve, veterans and, and who are serving. Thousands are serving Davis Monthan Air Force Base and, of course, the Army Post um, in, at Fort Huachuca. So this is something that is very, very important. One of the things I've committed to doing is, like Gabby Giffords and like Ron Barber and subsequently Martha McSally, all of those folks had a seat on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, that is extremely important to make sure that we keep those assets here and that we make sure that they're uh, funded in a way that they can remain here and it's a really it's just a very unique uh, couple of bases that we have here so uh, i think that is extremely important um, or on some kind of appropriations committee that is highly unlikely for a freshman but i would still push for it because what's even better than armed services would be becoming one of the folks that literally has to approve the, the preliminary budgets and that and that and where the money goes that's very that's very powerful in terms of making sure that those sorts of things happen. So, um, and then just talking about my work serving veterans for three years, from 2003 to 2006, I was privileged to have uh, to have those three years. Mostly, at, mm, about 50% of my time, um, as I trained at the U of A, I spent at our VA, our VA hospital, and um, so I, I met hundreds and hundreds of our veterans. Um, heard some amazing, amazing stories and helped mostly these guys, based on when I was there, but also a lot of gals as well, um, through whatever it was that was, that was ailing them. Uh, and so I, I have a connection, really I think a very deep connection to the community, to our veterans, those who have served, and I will keep that uh, you know, very much in the front of my mind as I, as I advocate for everyone. Yes, please. Um, I'm a new resident. Welcome. Thank you. I'm returning. I was probably at the VA when you were there. Oh, good. Back in 2003, but I became a nomad. Um, my my primary focus is on public lands. Mm, sure. Uh, and protection uh, of, of natural resources. I don't like to use the term resources because it means something like digging up. <laughs> something to use. Right. Yeah, I so, uh, and I, so I don't know your legislative history because I was gone with the Park Service. Um, so what, what, you know, can you tell me a little bit about what you would do in, with, with what, what's his face now? 
Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Mon Mon guy from Montana. Yeah. 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 Okay. Montana's a lovely place. It has nothing to do with his performance. It's lovely. It is. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I wish he would stop using the jets, though. I mean, isn't he doing that too? Yes. I hear yeah. he's, he's, he's yeah. abusing the, some of the transportation privileges of the, of the cabinet. He's sold a couple of national parks to avoid it. But isn't that's the deal? <laughs> he, 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 he rides around in D.C. on a horse. <laughs> well, he's, so, he's a character. Uh, yeah. While he's being colorful, uh, at least he don't get into the media as much as porn stars and $130,000 sure. and whatnot, uh, is, is the destruction of our monuments. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm a former park ranger. When I was living in Arizona, I worked at the Botanical Garden. So uh, it's, it's, to me, very integral into, into my uh, view of who I want to be. Right. No, absolutely. And we have to acknowledge that. Um, I, will, I can start. Um, let's see. So um, being supported when I was in the legislature from uh, 2009 to 2013, um, I was honored to have the support of the uh, Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters. They do not throw that support lightly mm -hmm. and they generally don't. Mm -hmm. You may not too many mulligans allowed, right? You can't, you can't, sorry, everything I talk about is gonna refer to what's coming on. It's just terrible, I But um, anyway, there's this, this not, not okay. Like you can't like, well, you know, it's okay that we have this, maybe let's create one or two more super fun sites. No, that's not all right. So that you can't really, you cannot deviate from, you know, their values and what they look at. So I, the reason I mention that is not to avoid the question, but to say like they have stamped me and that record that I have to show for those four years as a good one. Um, with, and I said that's an important place to start. I already have kind of walked the walk on issues that pertain to preservation, conservation, water, air, and land. Um, also, I'm a doctor. What I do is, um, I, we can't, I mean, think about asthma, COPD, all of these conditions that befall um, the folks of Shanghai, the folks of, of Beijing, with, uh, like you can't see half the time, they're all running around with masks on, right? We know what happens when we don't take care of the planet. Uh, and that goes not just to clean air, but obviously, you know, hexavalent chromium in the water supply or in the, in, in the land, in any of that. And so um, I see that, I see a lot of things that connect directly to health because it's how I kind of interact with folks that have had problems. And at the VA, I took care of a lot of, of folks who were um, exposed to Agent Orange, for example, mm -hmm. and terrible, terrible stuff, and, and the malignancies and the skin conditions and the all of that. And so like, I directly have seen what this kind of environmental exposure does, uh, and I think that's, you know, I, I could, sorry. Could I, no, I wanted to ask yeah. a follow-up. Sure. Uh, from what you're saying, your line of of, of thought, and, and I worked on the Yucca Mountain Project, so I know yeah. all the right. issues. Right. right. How would you, because you have to, you have to, I don't have to tell you, you have to couch things where people are, are, vis, are vis, visceral about it. Health mm -hmm. is one of them. Yeah. So, so how would you say, you know, we, uh, to 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 uh, preserve a national monument, uh, to preserve uh, well, Grand Grand Staircase, of course, is in Utah. Mm. But say, you know, they want to dig outside of Grand Canyon. You know, they want to mm. make a mess there. How would you uh, uh, use the health uh, factor in preserving our parks and monuments? Sure, that's great. I think that 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 it, that can be that can be very relevant because almost all of those types of activities, depending on what they're looking for, how far they're digging, where they're digging, I can make the case that this could jeopardize our groundwater. I can make the case that this could jeopardize, uh, we could take a different tactic and say, what are you gonna do to tourism? We depend on, there's just hundreds and millions of dollars of, of economic activity surrounding that. What are you gonna do to that? So there's a lot of ways to reframe the discussion. And that's how two of my, uh, two bills that I got through the legislature in my name, weird, most Democrats can't say that, and I'm not trying to be rude to anyone else because these are all my friends and colleagues, but it is very hard when I was there, 40 Republicans and 20 Democrats. So yeah, we were in a super minority, right? <laughs> and it's not easy to get anything through because one Republican gets annoyed with you and decides to sneeze in the general <laughs> direction and your bills are just obliterated. But. Um, working through the process, making friends with leadership, even though we disagree on so many things, I was able to get two very clean green energy bills through pertaining to the creation of uh, um, 
so growing basically plant life, algae, et cetera, for the use and production of biofuels. And um, both bills got through and are chaptered. They're part of our laws. That was back in 2012. And um, it's, it's one thing to say all the right stuff so that Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters, they're like, oh, you filled out the survey perfectly, thumbs up star. Great. And you never voted to throw burning tires into a mine shaft like half the Republicans have, so thank you. You know, it's not just not harming, <laughs> it's, we have to be proactive and protect as well. But it's, it's a pretty unique position to be in to not only have said the right things and said these are my values, but also to have um, actual legislative successes. And, and that's, it's especially in this, in this state with these governors and with this legislature. So I'm really proud of the fact that um, I didn't just do healthcare stuff. Um, that was, and it was, and how did I do it? It was a, basically we realigned the tax code to, uh, to have farmers that would grow things to be produced to turn into biofuel, to have them treated like other ag folks, right? Mm -hmm. So it was in a way kind of just, it was like almost a, a tax sort of cut, but, it, but that really appeals to a lot of folks that, you know, may be on the right side of things, right? So that's how you have to figure out how to talk to folks a little differently maybe, but about the same issue. Yeah, it's so. tricky. It is. Great questions. I'm sorry that was a long, I mean, it was like a four part question. So, um, there was someone else right around here, I thought. Yes, please. What's your position on military spending? Oh great! Is there now? That's that could be another like twelve part uh, response. So, <laughs> what, um, well, is there? Is there a? So, is there a? Before I start, is there a specific subsection of it, or is there a one particular or two particular issues that are in the back of your head that you want me to be sure to hit? Or I'm smiling because this question is somebody else's that asked me to ask it, oh, really? oh, and they're not that's here. Right. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. So, um, <laughs> as with with everything, military spending, all of the spending that we do, all of the budgeting stuff that we do, it's um, it, it has to be balanced, right? And so, it's extremely important. And for this area. We talked about the economic impact. So, uh, but I was on the appropriations committee for four years when I was in our legislature, and um, creating those budgets, deciding how we're spending the state tax dollars, or in this case, the federal tax dollars. Right? Um, that is that is the most important and uh, the most important thing that we're tasked to do in. Congress or in the legislature by the respective constitutions is to figure out what do we do with our pooled resources and how much do we spend on education, on health care, on military, on all of these things. And it is the most important thing. It's frankly, it's a statement of our values. It's what we, what we believe in and what we think we should fund, right? So um, national defense, national security, of course, right? But not at the expense of education or of allowing us to have 14, 15, 16% of the country uh, not covered by any type of basic medical care, right? So there are, so robust spending, of course, but it has to be balanced and we have to pull some other things up, as I guess I, is how I'd like to say it. We, we really have to get things balanced a little bit better and make sure that we're focusing on not just, not just that. I think um, we hear a lot of we really do hear a lot of, you know, I mean, even under the Obama administration, I believe the budget went up and up and up. I mean, it's over 700 billion now. And uh, even this Trump administration, I think they asked for what, 650 something or 660 something? And they got 703. <laughs> so they, it's, I don't even know. So it, it's pretty, it's, if we need 650 billion and you're getting 703 billion, what is that about? Why is that happening? And could that 53 billion be used to, I don't know, get those nine million low-income children access to healthcare for a few years? There are, just, there are other things I think we can also prioritize without throwing, you know, without in any way diminishing or endangering our, our national security. And that's the balance that I will, I will strike. What's the proportion within the state right now? Um, of military versus, say, education, military oh, versus healthcare. Oh, got it, healthcare. okay. So it's, it's a little <laughs> tricky because in the state realm, that's, a non, that's education, that's uh, actually um, Medicaid, so access mm -hmm. funding, corrections, I'm regurgitating stuff from my, my budget days in the probes. That, that is what we spend all of our, most of our state funds on. But the federal tax dollars, that's where you can have 
um, it's like, a, so there's like a, it's just a different pot of funds, right? So the federal is where uh, you have the military spending and then the, the other, a lot of other stuff. So I, it's not like, I know there's some funds at the state level to help our veterans, that's for sure, but most of that money comes from the federal side. So I'm not, not answering your question. I, it's just, it's different chunks of money. Does that make sense? So I don't have a... So what would you do if you're elected? Oh, well, I, as I said, so um, in, in, again, in, in specific to this or something else? No, it's specific Okay, to yeah, so as I, um, as I was saying, just keeping in mind um, that we have to, again, not just throw all this money over into this pot for military, we also need to have a distribution and a balance for other places. So work to make sure that we have, that we're moving closer to Medicare for all, getting people covered in terms of the health care and not just you know, buying more planes that the military says they don't want, right? That's like, that's, that's another thing that really, really freaks, I mean, what is going on? 3,000 tanks that nobody actually thinks we need. Where are we gonna use 3,000? What are we doing with tanks right now? I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't be prepared and have really great state-of-the-art technology and stuff that probably reduces our need to have humans in harm's way. Great, love it. But what in the world? Like, and it's because in some ways it's a jobs program, if you think about it, right? Um, which you know, then call it what it is. So we, we have, there's waste and there's areas where there's, again, that extra 50 or whatever billion of appropriations that happened that Trump didn't even ask for. Like, that's the kind of stuff where I will work as hard as I possibly can to, to shine light on it and to say, all right, we've got to get that somewhere else. We've got to get that to the EPA. We've got to get, let's, let's start funding the State Department again. You know, like, let's do, let's do that. You know, let's, let's, let's try to, is that, what did I say? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, let's, 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 I mean, we have so many, so that's, I guess, I'm, I'm not, there's so much, but I, I think that, like, all that other stuff, we have to, we have to prioritize as well. So I think that's my best answer for you. And tell your friend to come next time. <laughs> well, she's at two other meetings. Oh, wow. Good. Good, good, good. Excellent. Yeah. She has one back to back. Great. Oh, here. Um, let's see. She's have, very active. I don't have any more cards. I was going to say, I'd give her a card, but well, Brian will. Well, she's very active. Good. Georgia. Oh. Excellent. There's an extra one. Oh, perfect. Do you have Bill? Just so she can have a card. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Um, I don't know if there were any other hands, but is it? Yes, please. So. We know this is going to be a really big money race. Yeah, yeah. I mean, un unfortunately, lots of money in politics, that's yeah. for sure. I didn't interrupt to ask your question. So, no, no. So, um, if you are our candidate, are you going to be able to meet the kind of money that the Republicans will put up? I think so. Um, and I, I can, um, a good thing about having a candidate who's done this before is that um, you kind of know the drill, you've been through it, and this is complicated. This is not, it's not easy running for Congress. There's a lot of moving parts that I didn't even know about two years ago when I did this the first time. And so, um, as with a lot of things in life, sometimes you do big projects like this and it doesn't work out, but you learn a heck of a lot about how things work as you're doing it. So, not a lot's gonna surprise me. And I can say last time, and this is all uh, on the FEC.gov, you can go look up the 2016 race, I was able to raise $1.6 million as a first time candidate in a general election for Congress. That's almost everyone else last cycle and in, uh, in the other cycle, when you raise those kinds of funds, you're not running for office for the first, or you're not running for election next time, you're running for re-election. Right, because usually when you rate, when you get that kind of those kinds of resources, not that it's all about the money, um, but there you do have to have sufficient resources to get your name out there and to you know get your ads up on the air and to actually uh, and to really just get the message out. And so, um, because of the fact that uh, this has been done before, and I proudly was our nominee last time, and as soon as you're the Democratic nominee, what happens? What the Republicans like to do? They put your face up to next to Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. It used to be next to Barack Obama, but now we kind of miss him, and like everyone does. So like <laughs> that doesn't work. They know that I'd be I'd love that. I know they put they they put my face up next to Nancy Pelosi and ran like two million dollars worth of ads against me. It was pretty. Uh, I was going to ask you yeah. what happened. Yeah, exactly, and that's and that's exactly. It. Look, I will I will say it. Look, uh, um, 
So Martha McSally, who again, not there. She got in a World War II aircraft and flew away. So she's gone. She's not gonna be competing with me or any Democrat this time, which is great. And that makes it even more of an opportunity, though she was losing in all of the polling right. that we had already. Right. So she likes to say like, I left my safe district to go do other things. Mm -hmm. It was not a safe district. <laughs> That's just, you know, political speak. Um, but like having been through this, having had all the, 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 the name ID just from getting attacked, I know that sounds weird, but if they have to put your name and face on the TV, even in a negative way, it's teaching Democrats and some independents who to vote for. It's instructions. When you see a negative attack ad against me, that annoys Democrats sometimes, and they see Nancy Pelosi not necessarily like this horrible ogre that, that the Republicans love to talk about as her, to talk about as, with regard to her. Sometimes that actually is an instruction. So um, my point being, uh, name ID is key. And Martha McSally had run, I don't know, four times or something. She'd spent in excess of $25 million in the district. So her name ID was something like 96%. And at the time of the election, mine was like mid 60s or between 65 and 70%, which came from nothing. So like in a very short amount of time, I went from not much to, you know, two thirds of the people voting knew who I was, but when another 24% or so, or one other knew who she was or 30%, that just that's just the way it is. It's it's very it's basic math. It really is. If people know who you are before you're going in to vote on people, then um, you're going to do a lot better. And so this time around, things are reversed a bit. Any Republican who comes forward, um, well, there's one. I hear maybe two. There's for sure one running already. Um, we'll be starting like I was two years ago. We'll have very very little name ID, even if they're active in the community. Okay, it doesn't matter, because I'm sorry, you aren't active in the community. You do not interact with 379,000 people uh, over the course of a year, I don't think, right? Not unless you're like Oprah. Um, so, and she's not on anymore. So, uh, but no, that's, that's really it. And so I think that uh, being able to um, say, look, I did this once, learned a lot from it. I know why I didn't win. I did raise significant resources, and I think carried a message um, that was true to my values, and I'm, again, not gonna deviate from that moving forward. And um, having that, I can build on some of that progress that we already made, and I won't be running against someone who has tons of name ID. I'm running against someone who will be newly introducing themselves in a pretty rotten time to be affiliating yourself with the Republican label, in my opinion. So, um, so I think that that's why. Right in the back, yeah. Why do you think you didn't know it last time? So that, yeah, that's that's it. It's it's the it's the it's the just having such a difference in that name ID. Not Mar more, way more people knew who Martha McSally was than me because she had a lot more money. She spent. Uh, 7.3 or 7.4 million dollars against me. Every penny. I made her spend every penny, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Speaker Ryan, his pack oh, yeah. threw another threw about 700 and something thousand against me too. So they were just beating the snot out of me in terms of the ads. And now, um, again, the, some of those ads helped to raise my name ID actually. But um, now that Martha McSally is gone, I think that, that this creates another opportunity for uh, for the Democrats and I think Hopefully for me. Is there a danger that the Republicans are going to throw that much money at whoever runs? It, it is true that they, they are going to, well, okay. So there are now 91, including this, this district is a top 10 district, by the way, nationally. The, the AZ2, you're going to see all over the place. The second congressional district of Arizona is a big deal. It's already all over. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, and it's an empty seat. They're, they're very likely not gonna win it. I'm not saying this means complacency didn't do so well for us last time, right? <laughs> Hillary's totally not president, and that's a bummer. Um, but we can actually, I think we have, a, we, have, we have a great opportunity, and I think this time around with the resources, resources will be spread a lot thinner, right? Like the, the Democrats are actively contesting, I think it's 90 or 91 different seats all across the country open seats, not open seats, just incumbents underwater, all of that. And um, so, yes, they're gonna spend some money, but it's not limitless. I mean, there's, you can't, it, it's gonna be difficult for them to, also, they're pragmatists. They're not going to spend where they think there's no point. Um, and my polling already had me significantly ahead of Martha McSally. Okay, well, 
and we're doing polling now, what do you think it's gonna show against an, a Republican with no name ID? It'll be even better, most likely. So when that kind of data is coming forward showing that like, well, she's 17 points behind, why? Right, meaning, meaning my potential opponent. That's really important too. So I think that you, they're gonna have to make decisions about where to invest, and they're not gonna be able to put millions of dollars in 91 different districts. They just can't afford it. So, and in some cases, it's, things are so unpredictable right now. Normally, incumbents almost always win, but you see all these retirements, 30, yeah, what is it, two or something, different much. retirements on the Republican side, and I think 12 or 14 on the Democratic side. That's, that's, I think that's actually now a record. So that's pretty high. And that's rats leaving the sinking ship, right? Mm -hmm. Oops, I didn't mean to call Repub like they're not rats, but I'm saying like they are, they are, <laughs> they are instinctively getting off of something that doesn't look like it's going to be afloat for very long, right? And that is the Republican Party. So yes, ma'am. Uh, what's your view of this whole border security issue? Um, the, the, the wall and everything else, you know, what do you think would be effective on the border? That's a great point. We were actually just having a really good discussion about this um, with, uh, with the, is it the executive board? The steering, the, steering, the steering committee just before this, and that came up. Um, it, again, very complicated, but national, first and foremost, of course we have to find out, you know, know who's going where, and we have to secure the border. That makes sense. But the, I disagree with the president. Uh, I could probably stop there. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I disagree with the president in terms of, you know, a, a concrete or cinder block continuous wall from sea to shining, shining sea, which I guess we need one up with Canada too, right? I don't know. I mean, if we're gonna be consistent about it. That is absolutely not going to guarantee any security whatsoever. Um, what it will do is create some jobs, hopefully for union members. Um, so that part is kind of like a silver lining, but, um, but will it actually do anything with security? No. Uh, I don't think it really will. We have a physical barricade of some kind, uh, certainly on almost the entirety of the southern air border, uh, Arizona border. Um, that is not the case in part of New Mexico, and of course the Rio Grande in Texas is, is, you know, is a river, but it's also very shallow. So we need a lot of other stuff. And it, it's way, it goes way beyond that um, the, in terms of the whole wall discussion. I, think, I, don't, I don't think of wall as literally a wall, and I think the president does. Yeah. And that doesn't really confer or convey, it doesn't create a secure situation if you don't have properly <laughs> trained folks. And we have a lot of border patrol agents. I'm not saying we need more. I think that we just need to make sure they're trained in the way they need to be trained. Um, we need, uh, the drones really freak me out. Like, mm -hmm. think about it. I mean, like, they can carry 22 uh, kilos. That's a lot. That's actually, like, that's, a, that's like a, I don't know, it's a, it's a medium-sized dog, right? I mean, you can, you can you, of, whatever, great distances. And so having things on whatever barrier or whatever series of, of security uh, protections we have there to, to, to detect and then disable those little suckers, that's really important, right? Being able to detect like the El Chapo tunnels, mm -hmm. come on, like you have a really beautiful 30 foot wall and El Chapo is like dancing in the tunnel, <coughs> it's like refrigerator, he has like beers down there, and he's like a little motor, motorbike and stuff. Come on. Train so we, we yeah, a little train thing. So you, you have to, you can't just fool yourself into thinking that putting up a bunch of barriers is going to do it. You have to have a really intelligent way of getting an operational control of the border. And I think instead of wall, we have to go to that kind of concept of operational control and secure uh, border situation. So I know that I used a lot of words. Does that, I mean like weird words. Yeah, Does that no, make sense I, though? I think you, uh, what I'm getting is that you have to do things smarter yeah. rather than just blockade, which, yeah. uh, you know, the people coming across who aren't supposed to be coming across, I mean, who are the bad guys, yeah. so to speak, they, they're very wily, they've had years of experience, Sure. so you have to kind of outthink them. Right. And so, yeah, the, I would, whatever is the most strategic, I would think would be the best. And I think the important part of what, about what you're saying, and I really appreciate this, it's, it is, it's bad guys and gals, right? But it's, yeah. it's not, um, I mean, immigration is a net negative currently with Mexico, Central America, there are, are still people fleeing persecution and potentially murder that, that, are, that are coming across the border. But um, it's, it is the really horrific 
human sex slave trafficking that's going on, guns, right? Guns are going south to Mexico and money is coming north. Um, and of course drugs, right? And those, that is all criminal activity. No one, not a Democrat, not a Republican, I don't think any American would, would, be, would accept that, right? That's criminal activity. All of us can agree on that one. And that's what I'm talking about. And so I think it's really important to, and so it really is essential to get that operational um, you know, control and security for sure. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about, um, whether it is actually a large physical barrier or not, would be employing folks, which I, I like. It makes, it makes sense that if we're gonna be doing this kind of stuff, even if I don't always agree with the policy, at least make sure that Americans are getting jobs out of it, right? Well, and I understand that some of the uh, Border Patrol is quitting, you know, because yeah. the conditions, not maybe specifically in Arizona, but my understanding from a news story about Texas was the, there's no housing. They're kind of out in the hmm. middle of nowhere. They don't have anywhere to put their families. They're isolated. Sure. And for many reasons, a lot of them are kind of bolting, you know. Right. So I, I think that's as important as anything else is to make sure your employees are happy yeah. and that they'll stay, you know. Yeah, security is of course essential, but you have to actually like what you're doing and, and be able yeah. to, to, to have a life. So no, I agree. Um, and I have, I have read study, I mean, the, the turnover at the Border Patrol is actually quite, quite high. Um, and the averages I'm seeing are in the two to three year range sometimes, and then people are going off to other, sometimes it's other agencies or just a better location or, or whatever the issue is. So no, we can't have that because you need, once you train someone up to do this, relatively complicated stuff in some cases, then they're now gone in the FBI or something. So, right. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have two questions. Yeah. One, if you could tell us a little bit in short of how do you see your candidacy different than other colleagues running for the same seat? Okay. How would you say you differentiate your different than them? And secondly, what would be some of the causes that you, or some legislation that you'd like to champion, change, or improve, or create new new bills? That's like two 12-part questions. <laughs> uh, okay, <clears throat> can I write on the board? No, sure. I'm, just I'm not gonna actually write on the board. Um, but I do like, I really like dry erase boards, so that's great. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll, let me do the second question first. I think I can, I can make that pretty succinct. Um, and I will rephrase it. So I'll just say like one of, if not the first, one of the first bills I would, I would champion would be um, to address, uh, to address like prescription drugs and prescription drug prices. It's something I know well. It's something that I think almost everyone can agree on. And it truly is a, a question of big pharma and their profits versus people and patients getting access to the to the care and the, and the medications they need. So um, putting forward a, a bill that would allow um, Medicare, just like the VA, to negotiate prescription drug prices. And on behalf of, the VA does it on behalf of three million veterans. And there are about 53 million Medicare beneficiaries in the nation. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, so having the center for, the director at the center for administrator, excuse me, at the CMS, and the Center for Medicare being able to go to AstraZeneca and Pfizer and say, nope, you have to drop this 38% or we're going with them, right? For all of the formulary for those 53, that's an amazing, amazing, and that bargaining ability, that helps taxpayers to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. Uh, but more, I think just as importantly, it, what I see in the hospital, that allows my patients to take their medicines like we prescribe them, instead of taking them every other day or every third day, or not feeding themselves, right? It's some pretty horrible stuff that I hear from my patients trying to take their medication just because it's so darn expensive and they have very fixed, limited income. So that's, I think, and that goes to economy, health, and a lot of other issues. So that's, um, is that good? I could go like, okay, cool. And then the first, um, so, like, at, if you've been, have you, no, there hasn't been any form down here. That's going to be next month. It's next month. Uh, but there, so. I'm familiar with, with all of them because I'm, I'm new to Green Valley. I come from LD9, so I've, I've seen all of you. Oh, great. Okay, good. Okay, so, no, and we're all, and we're all actually, we're all, we're all friends. I mean, the one thing that you'll, you'll see from the form is, like, we're not, um, I don't know, you, you saw some really weird stuff with the 17 Republicans <laughs> running for president. They were all, and, and, you know, I disagree 
with sure with with you know the former congresswoman on many issues i just don't think that she has that connection to southern arizona like like i do and the others do but I mean, we're friends. I've given her personally thousands of dollars from my own pocket to help her win her previous elections, and so has she has done the same for me. She sent me, she called me up. Uh, I shouldn't say positive things about other people, right? <laughs> okay, fine, I, will, I started it, so I have a rule. You have to start, keep, keep going on the topic if you start it. So this was out of nowhere, doing call time and raising money for my last campaign, and calls and says, hey, I'm sending you a $1,000 check. Like, Wonderful, but what are you doing? Like so now, anyway. But no, so like no, we're we're friends. We're friendly, and um, but we're also in in a discussion about our values, and 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 I think it's going to be up to you all to decide um, who's the best connected with Southern Arizona. And I think that when you're asking that kind of question, who gets it? Who um, who really understands what's going on here? I think that my 15 years of treating families in the hospitals, and not just, yes, the largest hospital is Tucson Medical Center in terms of the number of beds, right? But think about this. I have the, because of uh, the way that our system works and rural hospitals have fewer surgeons, cardiologists, et cetera, so from all of Cochise County, from the hospital in Wilcox, from Benson Hospital, Copper Queen and Bisbee, all these little hospitals, when they get people that are a little sicker or a lot sicker, mm -hmm. they put them on a helicopter or in an ambulance and up they come. They, they head up to TMC or they go to the Banner UMC or to St. Joe, one of the larger referral facilities because they need to for a heart attack or they need their appendix taken out or something. So think about this, I'm in central, I'm in central Tucson and I'm meeting hundreds and hundreds of people uh, throughout you know month to month to month, but I'm also having amazing interactions with and learning from and talking to people from Bisbee and people from Douglas on the border who tell me stuff about border issues. Mm -hmm. So I don't just read about it, I hear about this sometimes from my patients who don't just talk to me about uh, fevers and again nausea, vomiting, bleeding, whatever, they, they also tell me what's going on in their lives. So I bring that up again because that's, that I think is so tremendously important. This election cycle, I think more than any other one that I've ever been a part of, um, we, we the voters, I think people really want authenticity. They want people truly that are part of their community that understand them, that care, and that can show that. And so I think that's, that's really important. So that turned into more of a positive about me. Um, <laughs> but, 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 and, and but there are differences between all of you. There I mean, are. Come on, so the, of course. So, um, you should be able to, to say how you yeah, have well, I, I don't, without embarrassment. You know, it's not embarrassing. I think that, that um, I think a lot of that, I, a lot of that connections, that, that kind of trusted relationship with the community and working with people through the hospital, like I talked about, that isn't something that I understand is similar with any of them. I don't think that any of them have that same kind of connection, I would say. In terms of some of the I mean, environmental issues, minus, minus Anne, we're all pretty similar on a lot of that. But uh, please. Here. Yeah, I was just going to mention, you, you told us a few things mm -hmm. where you and Anne were different in terms of things she voted for. Sure. When she, and and I, some of that was new to us. It was very interesting to us. Yeah. I would suggest you share that. Yes, that's true. Because good. you you are of a different opinion than her votes. That's true, and it's and, and and the records. So the records speak really for themselves because I don't get to go back to 2010 and change something. If I voted that way as your representative, it's there forever, right? Um, so you know what I think of Senate Bill 1070, which of course was the Papers Please law, which was awful and terribly endangered. So I was in the House in 2010 in April, I think it was April, late May or early April when we voted on it, and I voted no, of course, right? And um, now Ann wasn't there, but she had the opportunity during that campaign cycle to speak out against it, like Terry Goddard did. Unfortunately, he lost, but he did the right thing. And that isn't something that she chose to do. You know, she, she changed the subject, she would talk about Eric Holder being an awful person for suing our state, and, but it would never turn into, it, it just, it wasn't the kind of messaging that I was really pleased with, and I, so I think that, that's a difference. And, uh, but especially on, on where we can look at and compare our records on the environmental stuff that we talked about, um, really anti, some of the anti-EPA stuff, um, I was really concerned that she voted against the Clean Power Plan in 2015. I found that just, I mean, the Leave Conservation voters flipped out. 
Um, they actually ran about twenty-five thousand dollars worth of digital ads, kind of attack ads, like talking about how annoyed they were um, during an off cycle, like in twenty fifteen. Who does that? That's really unusual. So they were the environmental community was really concerned about that particular uh, vote, you know. So and where else am I on that? Let's see. Oh, oh my gosh. So in twenty, also in twenty ten, which was a rough year, uh, I guess for Anne. Um, but in twenty ten, she didn't show up to vote for the DREAM Act, and I have absolutely no explanation, and I don't know that she does either, but you'd have to please ask her at some point, because I think that, um, and I don't get that. Um, th but with regard to Mary, Bruce, um, Billy, the, the other folks, mm -hmm. um, I don't have, it's not as easy to do that kind of comparison, because I can't say here's my record, here's hers, here's where we don't connect or, or agree, because they don't have a record. Well, Bruce does. Well, Bruce, Bruce and I were pretty, pretty, yeah. I think we, and he's we were pretty, conversive. very, yeah, mm -hmm. I think we were pretty, pretty close on almost, all, for the two years we were there together, I know that we were pretty close on almost all the issues. Um, so, but what I would say, again, back to filling out the survey, checking the boxes, looking good on paper is one thing, but then you get to, as you brought up, can you do it? Can you raise the money? Can you get your name out there? Do people know who you are? Will you actually be able to win the primary and then go on to win the general? And I would submit to you that that, that is not likely with some of my other opponents. And that's not anything negative. I'm just saying it's, it's difficult to see how that would happen starting out with very low name ID. It's just so I would say that one of my one of my advantages, I guess, is having done this before, a lot of that stuff is kind of built up already. And starting from scratch, that's a really, really big gap and to try to make up. So progressive values we share, but then who's gonna get across the finish line kind of becomes, you know, it's up to you, frankly. I mean, like it's you you guys get to make this call. But I think that um, I think that, that that shows not only consistency of values, but also viability. And one of the things I hear from a lot of my pro progressive friends is they're sick to death of supporting people that say all the right stuff, but don't know how to run a campaign. And I'm not saying that about my opponents at all, but like just in general, like, y yes, you look great and sound great on paper, but you just don't have that logistical stuff down. You don't, you know, you don't know who to hire for campaign manager or when to hire them. You don't know who to get to do your ads or if maybe you don't have resources to do that. All of that stuff is important. So it's not just the values where we are mostly consistent minus the congresswoman. It's also who can actually navigate and execute that campaign and get across the finish line with those progressive values intact. And I think I can do that. See, it was a quite 12 part times two. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a stop talking? No, no, oh. that's, my, I have a question. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so clearly you've learned a lot over the last couple years from the last campaign. Yeah. What would you, what will you do differently, if anything, in your advertising, in how you present yourself to us? For example, we've learned things about your record versus Kirkpatrick's mm -hmm. today yeah. that we didn't know. I didn't know, actually. <laughs> I just looked, I started looking it up myself. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good stuff. Sure. It is. So how will you present yourself any differently than you did then? For, for sure. So, I mean, a lot of it um, last time was, it was my first go around basically, and you know there was a primary with Victoria Steele, right? And right. so that was that that was before the general even happened. Um, it was a lot of like, here's who I am. Just know my name, right? Like that's the thing. Like like you all maybe are somewhat familiar, or you remember that I was on the ballot perhaps last time. But I folks on you. and the, and or voted for me. You Thank did. you. I'm Maybe sure you did. did. But sure did. a lot of people aren't here. The vast majority of people are not here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's those folks that you have to kind of like, okay, just know the name. Just fit, okay, he's that doctor guy. Mm -hmm. Fine, I'll take it. Right? Just doing that is what I was. A lot of that was kind of what we were doing in the primary. Yeah. It wasn't Victoria's awful. I love Victoria. She's mm -hmm. great. And P.S. She turned around the moment she didn't win the primary and was like one of my biggest advocates. So like props. That's how that's how you lose, like in a really good way, right? Like. I've lost primaries before, I've obviously lost generals before, um, but that's how you, you try to help, you know, the, you try to help your Democratic colleagues and friends out, so. 
But um, so yeah, I, I did I did a lot of that kind of advertising, which was just like in introduction. Then now this this is a bit of a different this is a different type of a campaign. Now there's six people running. A lot of people may know who I am. Um, some will know who Anne is and the others, but now we have to have some more discerning, some more like a, a bit more of a, I guess, detailed conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And truly, this group is an exception because you're here today at, I don't know what time it is now, but like two or three, right? Mm -hmm. And you're interested in this and it's like 10 months away from the election. That is unusual, right? That is not normal. No, that's not trying to be <laughs> So that, I'm, I love it, but like it's not, I wish it were more normal, right? So like um, that's, but, but like, the, but for the, for kind of the average casual, they'll vote, but like they're certainly not going to pay attention for many more months. That is the question. What, what kind of stuff like that is going to need to get out there and what makes the most difference? And we'll be doing some research as to what that is. But um, for sure, the short answer is yes, we will be focusing on making sure that people know, um, okay, here's where I was on 1070 and we don't really know where Ann was or, or, or all that kind of stuff. That, that right. will be coming out there. It, there will, there will be um, digital, uh, they'll be coming out digitally. That, there may very well be some some TV ads for sure, and just their other, you know, and, and, and definitely letters to people, just, you know, mm -hmm. typical campaign stuff, but we're not going to like bury that because you need to make a decision. Who, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. is going to be the best person to represent Southern Arizona, um, and who is going to be able to defeat uh, whoever the Republicans put forward, um, but also who is going to be able to be truly consistent or largely consistent, hopefully almost entirely consistent with the values down here and with a lot of more progressive values. So, and, and that's, I think, what you're saying is really important for us to be able to make that decision. Oh, that was simultaneous. I'm going to go. Oh, yeah, first. Well, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. first, I'd just like to give you kudos for being persistent. And oh, thank you. Now I want to thank everybody to Dreamland. Uh, <laughs> we have gone through the election. You have won. Great. Okay. You're in Washington. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> there's lots to do. Uh, I wonder how you feel about the things that our president has been doing that he should never be able to do. Uh, I, I will need to go to the I'm board. I'm going to be 70 in a couple of months, and I think I am currently a 16-year-old in civics class looking ahead going, oh my God, no, right. this is not what you taught me. This is not how this works. Right. Him signing away the oil rights offshore and-, and Except uh, Florida, and because he doesn't want to irritate, he doesn't want to irritate, he doesn't want to irritate, well, he doesn't, oh, that's a good yeah. point, his own property. There are yeah. so many things that I had no idea he could do by himself that he has done, because every time I asked, well, there's norms. He doesn't pay an attention to one norm. Right. So if you were there, would you be willing to work on making sure that this won't happen again? Oh, of course. I think it is so, so important that the 16, 15, 14, the, 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 I mean, folks that are still learning about this stuff, we have to, every day, we have to be horrified by some of the stuff he does, not by everything. I mean, we wouldn't survive. I mean, blood pressure, strokes, it'd be, it'd be terrible. But, um, Could I but, talk to you about medication? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> free, free advice for my friends. Um, so yeah, um, so no, it, it, like that's, we really, like that's the thing that concerns me because even sometimes I'm like, ah, of course he said that. No, 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 no. The answer is, this is ghastly, this is not presidential, this is not America. Right, and that's not a, even a party thing because I don't think he's a Republican. Oh, I don't know. Um, I because I have a lot of really Neither good. Neither do I think he's a Christian. I, I, Christian I, is right. Christian. Oh come on! Uh, <laughs> haven't you haven't you read two Corinthians? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I think if you went back and had, and I'm surprised it hasn't happened. Somebody go in two things. One, go back and, and check his church attendance before he decided to become president. Zero. And better yet, where is the person? 
that they paid to take Donald's tests while he was in college, where he proved he was a brilliant student. I'm really surprised those things haven't shown up. They must have paid a whole bunch for him. He has a good brain. Awarded him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, I, <clears throat> he continues to disturb me, as I think it sounds like he continues to disturb everyone here, right. and that's really important. It's important for like the American experiment. Um, for these United States to continue in this republic, not to get all you know, 1860s on you, but <laughs> but it's re it's really important because um, and like the founders, they 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 were not stupid. They they figured out kind of like okay, there's not always going to be. I can't, I'm going to get the quote wrong, but James Madison in the Federalist Papers number 10 said something to the effect that um, there will not necessarily always be an enlightened individual. <laughs> Uh, in this office, meaning in the office of the presidency. Well, bingo. Um, so I, I think we've, we've, you know, I give up several of my, you know, left-sided paired organs to get George W. Bush back. You know, like, I mean, so like, I will take Romney. I will take like, forget the Democrats. Let's just get not. I don't know what that is. Because like, they, they. I think like all of us, it'll be Republican. It'll be Democrat. Maybe someday there'll be an independent. I don't know. But all of us, I think, kind of want that experiment called America to continue. And I don't know that Trump has any concept of what we're talking about right now, right? And so that's really, really scary. And so we, we have to continue to be really upset about the stuff that he's doing and saying because he's doing it on our behalf. Davos wants him there. I'm pretty sure the French president, like Stephen Colbert said, the French president just wanted to have Trump go there to laugh at him. <laughs> and that is hilarious oh, and horrible, right? That's, he, they're not laughing at Trump, they're laughing at America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, ha we have to, you know, slashing and burning the State Department, you know, this is, it, Putin might as well be in there. I mean, right. this is perfect is, for them. Is, is. Well, okay. <laughs> Boy, good point. So um, I, anyway, so I see, yeah, I guess, I'm not really even answering your question, but in January of 2019, if he is still our president, um, because I don't know if that's going to be the case. Um, or Mike Pence, or <laughs> Speaker Ryan. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Um, like, I don't pray, but every night I go, bless Mueller, bless yeah. Mueller. Right. Um, no, I, I think, you know, I will, I will adhere to those values. I think I'm pretty clear about them. And I, uh, I have a great deal of respect for this country. It's the best one in the world still. And I, you know, when I was at Health and Human Services, helping Secretary Sebelius and um, then Secretary Burwell to implement the Affordable Care Act. One vote, by the way, you'll hear that from my opponent, one vote is great, meaning authorizing the ACA, but working in the trenches every day and every night to educate patients, nurses, physicians, mm -hmm. all the communities that need to know what the heck this complicated new law is and does and how it can help. I did that for two years at the request of President Obama, which was amazing and exhausting, and I'm glad I did it every minute. And when sometimes I would leave that building at like 10 p.m. And in the bitter cold, which I do not like, um, <laughs> you know, I would walk across the mall to get to the, the metro to get to my apartment there, and Capitol, right? Washington Monument, amazing. So like, it's, he's not going to destroy that, as much as it seems like he might be trying. So I just gotta keep that, your hearts, right? So. He has help. Well, yeah. Oh wait, I, you're first. Yeah. 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 I actually, I have two issues that I think are really important in Arizona, and I think it can, it can be difficult sometimes to get voter support depending on where you are on, on the side of the issues. One is ir immigration reform, and the other is gun. Gun control. Oh, gosh. Uh, this is this is a state that drives me absolutely crazy mm -hmm. in terms of gun laws, and but I also know that there are a whole lot of people in this state who have very different feelings than I do about gun control. How do you walk right that here. road and keep to your values in yeah. terms of gun safety? That's that's a really good point, and I uh, look the. the so we just talked about this in the steering committee. So just a few days ago, two people died in Kentucky in a school shooting. Right. That was the, that was the, which not that, not that the president acknowledged this, by the way, um, at least until like a minute ago. Um, the 11th shooting since 
the beginning of the year. Every other day, right? School shooting. Um, 15 year old, right? So, um, and you probably heard of the 19 year old who seems quite deranged from Michigan that was threatening CNN Center in Atlanta because because they're fake news, right? Because of the because of the stuff. Some of the words and phrases our commander in chief is saying. This for folks who are not well, like who are not able to really differentiate between an instruction from the president and just him doing a PR thing, like that can be people who are susceptible to that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Then they, he took that as an order, right? It seems like so. Um, yeah, so guns, big deal. Where you know mm -hmm. Canada has about the same number of guns per capita as we do. They're mostly shotguns and rifles and hunting things and whatnot, and some handguns. And they don't have the, the kind of the kind of shootings, the kind of murders, the kind of gun violence that we have. So it is a hugely complicated issue. The NRA, which I know in this room is a bit of a swear word, I understand, and it is for me as well, because it's no longer about the individual NRA members. This isn't a group of gun owners getting together to talk about hunting, because that would actually be totally fine. It's actually, and you know that like gun owners, and, and one of them, my friend, friend Frank Antonori, uh, taught me about this. He's all about the concert. He had a, a very conservative, um, rightward-leaning yeah. state senator from several years back. Um, we actually partnered together on a few bills, and um, all about conservation, preservation. Because where where are his deer, right? Yeah. So like, it's it's interesting where you can kind of like bring people together. So anyhow, that's not that's not the kind of person that that kind of gun hobbyist hunter wants to. Look, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about. Um, these the, the laws that are really put forward by the NRA, which is not again really representing individuals, it's representing the lobby, the the manufacturing mm -hmm. lobby, right. and so never forget that because I, I know a lot of doctors, they're NRA members, and they do not agree with um, silencers. That was one of the right after Vegas, right? Well, right. The, right after the Vegas uh, slaughter happened, they want and the bump stocks yeah. as well, like essentially making those automatic weapons. They don't agree with that, and they don't agree with you know a couple. Made, some of them made jokes to me like, "Look, if um, whoever's attacking you, if you, if you if you empty your ten, if you have ten bullets in a magazine in, in your handgun or in whatever weapon you're using, and you empty that at the perpetrator, it's just your time." I mean, like, if you cannot, oh. like, defend yourself with those, with tank, because, like, that's mm -hmm. what, um, actually, I, I, I'm a gun owner, I am a gun owner, and my, actually, was a present, and it was in Michigan at the time when I uh, would received it, and there, we were within the assault weapons ban, that, um, the 10-year period from 93 or 4 mm -hmm. through, um, 2004, when, of course, W did not push forward to, to reauthorize it, but th at that time, you could only have 10 bullets in a magazine. And we know here firsthand, unfortunately, with Gabby Giffords, what happens when you have 30 or more bullets in a magazine. Because the only moment, same thing with the guy shooting in Vegas, right? The only time when they could actually move around, try to stop, try to save people, was when there were no bullets flying. So when you have Jared Loeffner firing 31 bullets continuously, not even Kevlar wearing cops could do anything. Also, it happened in like 15 or 16 seconds. Right, so you can't even get a call out to anyone to come and help. So it, the magazines question is really important, and that goes to the assault weapons ban, um, and then of course who's allowed to purchase them. And in terms of folks that are not um, well, especially, I don't want to, I don't want to point fingers at the mental health community because the, the thing that irritates me so much as a doctor is that. It's really something the NRA talks about. Even our own Ron Barber would talk about, oh my gosh, we have to fix behavioral health. We do, but how dare you conflate? Do not put those two together. Right. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Over here, we have a tremendous need to help people who have behavior, behavioral health issues, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, what have you. And over here, we have a very different issue, and that is they are not together because if a person who is unstable has a weapon, there's about a 95% chance they are going to hurt someone, and who's it gonna be? Themselves. Themselves. They're gonna commit suicide. They're not gonna go out on a rampage. And but so they use they use that and say, oh, we don't need to talk about 
any sort of restrictions or debate bringing back the assault weapons ban, my gosh, perish forbid, never. Um, we just need to, you know, talk about people who are like uncontrolled paranoid schizophrenics. Like, hmm, no. So don't let people do that. Um, but uh, I would say, uh, maybe not the whole thing, but certainly I would really like to look at um, a discussion about some components of the assault weapons ban. I don't understand why Anne opposed it. Um, because of another money. Yeah, I don't actually That's know. Do they, do they endorse her or not? I'd have to look that up. But, um, oh, she had an A rating from the NRA. That's, no. that's, 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 that's hard to get for a Democrat. Um, but anyhow, so no, I mean, I'm, well, you, it was, I'm, I don't know if I, you, you talked about guns, and what was the other one? Did I miss something? Immigration reform, just because it is a yeah. big issue in Arizona. Yeah, and it is, and, and, and that was, we, let's see, where we, we talked a bit about that with the wall and the concept wall, but yeah. other than the, operational control of the border and that security concept, we have to look at um, how we got here. Like my grandfather came from, I guess it was barely, just barely Lebanon. And, and now it's um, still Lebanon, but um, <laughs> like, in the, like in the 30s. So, uh, but it was a bit of it, what used to be Syria, but anyway. So um, that was where like the kind of the Arab path of my family came from. And then the German half, and that was like, yeah, in the early 1930s, 20s. So the German half would be very welcome by our current president because it's- <laughs> It's not quite it's Norway, but yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, not yeah. Quite, it's not quite Norway. It's not quite Norway. The other yeah. half, not so much. No, no, not the, no, so much. Um, so like, yeah, but, but the, 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 German, the German half was, gosh, I don't know, Catherine the Great and our relatives got into some sort of tiff. So back, back in the 1880s, so, so off, off they went to America. But that's where we, all of us come from somewhere, right? And uh, including those, if there's anyone here who happens to be uh, part of the native population, I don't see anyone, I don't know. But like, also, right? Like, like, like land bridges, and it was many, many tens of thousands of years ago. We all kind of came here from somewhere else. So um, it's really important that we don't cut that off. And we have to welcome those who obviously aren't criminals and obviously don't mean us any harm. But um, it's a, it's, we still attract, even with Trump for now, we are still attracting some of the greatest minds in the world. They're coming here to learn and to, con and, and to, and to educate themselves, obviously. And many of them want to stay here and start a family. Um, but I'm worried because more and more and more coming here, learning, leaving. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. Like you, you have come in here, you're the cream of the crop from a vast majority. That's what it is. Or on the other side of things, like, come on, read the inscription on the Statue of Liberty. Like, that's how my grandfather got here. And they renamed him because they couldn't pronounce it. So, um, <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. We're, we're happy to be here. So, I don't know. I think that we have to, it, so legal naturalization reform broadly, we have to do it. Um, and it has to come from, you know, a, a good place, right? So, I mean, okay. Oh, yeah. Loss of the individual mandate, you, is that going to have a big impact on our rural hospitals? I thought so, but I don't, it's not going to be as much. And I heard something actually from Secretary Sebelius about this as well, and that has to do with the fact that we had, even though they took the, um, the sign-up period and they squashed it into, what, six weeks or something, yes. right? Um, trying to, like, just strangulate the whole thing. And by gosh, nine point something million people signed up, which was, like, 60% higher rate of sign-up than they, that we'd ever have seen before. So it didn't get quite up to the, you know, 11-ish million we were hoping for, but it got pretty darn close. So I don't think so. And those who are most dependent on assistance or subsidies to help for those premiums, the way the law is written, uh, this is way, I mean, sorry, lots of, but to answer your question, it, it, the subsidies are based on the person's income. So if premiums go up, for example, the people that are qualified based on their income, those rules don't change. It just means that the taxpayers have to pay a little bit more to keep that premium affordable. But the individual, those families, will still have that same, as long as they qualify based on their income and the number of families, et cetera, members in their family, they will still be able to get that uh, the subsidy. So, um, so no, it, will it make some of the plans more expensive for folks that don't get a subsidy like me? That's probably true. Um, although I actually noticed that my premium went down 11 bucks this year, so I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see. I don't know if that's true for other states or not. Um, but good try. I don't think that it's going to work. 
and mm -hmm. um, it's and because of all the uncertainty, these companies aren't stupid. They have they employ like just like rows and rows of actuaries and with their calculators and their fun little hats. Um, they probably don't wear those as accountants anyway. But they, they are trying to predict for years what's going to happen with the market, utilization, and all this kind of stuff they look at. And they're not, they're not stupid. So they, 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 when, once Trump got elected, they're like, oh, okay, we have to build in a pretty big what the heck is going on buffer, right? Because, so that they can, so they don't get into a place where they price things so low chaos ensues and then you know who knows what else is going to happen so I think they built in some serious some pretty smart buffers and that's why we aren't seeing as much of a disruption uh, but I don't think they're done trying I think didn't, didn't Ted Cruz just say they want to try repealing the Affordable Care Act in total again yeah um, so <laughs> hey, he has to say something to excite his base because Republicans are actually pretty uh, some Republicans are pretty contented right now which means they aren't going to show up um, which is great so, um, yes, please. Uh, just a comment on that. Scott, Walk Scott Walker is advocating strengthening the Affordable Care Act. Good. Oh, wow. Really? Well, wait a minute. Did, did, didn't he? But he just watched this a state senator in a Trump plus 20 something district flip to a D plus 10, yeah. right? So I think maybe he had some other. You know reasons, but like he, he, he's you know reading the writing on the wall. <coughs> I, I want to make two other comments. One, a very short one. Sure. About the the whole thing about gun control. Um, the whole thing about background checks has been used almost as a litmus test. Yeah. Yep. But if you think about it, so many of these mass shootings, a background check would not have mm -hmm. prevented. That's true. There was, I think, one in Florida might have helped, but yeah. for the most part, it would have helped. No. Now, there's also lots of other carnage because of guns that aren't mass shootings. Mm -hmm. right. That's a point. No, you're right. That. But I want you, you touched on the Davos meeting. Yeah. And ongoing. So if you just saw an update of some kind, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I'm sure he said it. My, my, uh, Hope has been that he would get roundly snubbed there, but maybe, maybe not. Uh, but the thing is, his <coughs> trade policies are incredibly stupid for America. I mean, even for Trump, they're stupid. And Canada didn't seem to like it. Right. They went elsewhere. Right. And it's going to really have a, a major impact on the Arizona economy. Sure. A lot of those discussions are. I mean, right now, apparently, there's a renegotiation of NAFTA happening, and like the U.S. negotiators have not changed their position, whatever that is. I'm not entirely clear on it, but it is not something that Mexico and Canada is necessarily a fan of. So, about, about using the chicken tax to keep Mexican-made trucks out of the U.S.? Sure. I, I, and, that's, and that's not, again, this, these are the kinds of things that I don't, this administration, I mean, he had a, there was a 24-year-old running his, this drug czar who, like, you know, I, think, I don't know he why, but month, he just left. Oh, okay, yeah. great. Oh, well, no. that was, that's good. So, like, but that, this is, they don't, there are so many unfilled, very important roles throughout, yeah. you know, not just state, not just <laughs> commerce, all over the place. There's, there's just, you don't have ambassadors. And, and yeah, we have tons of ambassador, uh, uh, well, and then they, they keep, he keeps nominating some that are just really, what? Um, like and some of the judges. Like, I mean, did, he had, he nominated, it's, it's that back to your, so, yes, we, we are, this is another thing that concerns me because we're giving up a position of respect, but also of that leadership role in the world. And um, so Canada is like, all right, we'll do this. So they're doing the whole TPP thing. They're, 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 there's just all, you know, and um, everywhere, every other country in the world I think including Syria. I mean, everywhere yeah. is on the Paris Climate Accord, right? Yeah, right. Except for us. You know, Russia's like, what are you doing? Like, so that, 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 that kind of, it just, again, it's, it's, it's ignorance, it's a lack of understanding and experience, and I, I just, yeah, it's very frustrating. I think, I think Canada is going to build a wall. <laughs> I wonder. And I don't the White House, so he can't get out. Right. One more question. Sure. Oh, um, I did. I 
Okay. Okay. Just just because this is the last question, it's a little bit on the lighter side. Okay. Now I'm not a doctor, but you are. So, how do you feel about the medical report that we received on Trump being oh, an excellent? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's true. That is a very interesting report. So he grew an inch. Um, yes, he did. That, that is, yes, that is amazing. Oh my, gosh. Like, my, my dad keeps trying to tell me that. He's 81, and he thinks he's still like six foot. I'm like, dude, no, man. <laughs> you were six foot when you were playing for like the Cornhuskers, by the way, in Nebraska, if anyone likes, likes Yay. Yay. So, <laughs> in like the mid 50s. I'm like, you were six foot you know, when you were a linebacker, but no, I don't think you were uh, six foot. <laughs> That's just not the way it works. Those little discs kind of squished down. So no, I, 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 it seems like, and this is, there's been a history of this back to Kennedy and beyond in terms of, um, this is a bit of an embarrassment for the profession, right? But like there have been, medical professionals, um, I hate to say outright lying, but certainly discovering or obfuscating a little bit, make, making unclear, right, the, um, the exact health conditions, if present, for our um, elected leaders, specifically the presidency. And I, I think that, that that can get us into some serious trouble. Like, mm -hmm. it's one thing, he's a little pudgy, or a lot, but, but it's another thing entirely if that goes to um, like mental health, mm -hmm. right? Because that is very concerning for me. I, I think we had that situation with regard to to uh, you know President Reagan. I think mm -hmm. that's pretty well documented. And folks who are on the outside looking in, I'm not a psychiatrist, though I, I'm trained in some of that. That it, there's just a lot of concerning stuff going on there. So the the idea of um, a medical professional, especially one who's trained and who is in, you know, decorated in our military, um, not being completely, very transparent and clearly open and honest about things. That is, I mean, you had to have the part-time neurosurgeon, Sanjay Gupta, who was like, excuse me, the coronary calcium score is over 100, and he's on a statin medication, and he's borderline obese urging on obesity because he grew that inch um, or he's just obese which he yeah, is, which he is. Um, uh, so he has heart disease and then and only then did the doctor say well yeah yeah holy crap I mean like it was it was really that was quite the quite the like you know if you were my patient and I was like well I mean it's a small Yes, you could call it a lung mass, but I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to name it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to. You don't know. You don't want to. You, one of the things as a physician, as a nurse in the medical, as a health profession, good or bad, you have to be open and honest about what's going on. So, uh, what I don't like is partial sharing of information for the purposes of kind of. But he wasn't, because the president said, you go out there and answer any question they have. And the moment he said that, he actually unbound that position. But I don't know, we, we've seen it, I mean. I wonder about behind the scenes, how unbound he was. I, I, I don't know. It's still, it's still private. No, agreed, agreed. But um, I just, it's, it's a very interesting situation. And it, 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 in, to my way of thinking, it implicates the profession, and I don't like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do not like using that kind of medical information partially to, to for political expediency. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the, the, gross. The, the Admiral first said very good, and then at the press conference, it got bumped up to excellent. Yes. Right, <laughs> the best You're right. That's ever, right. Mm -hmm. people are saying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so that yeah. was bad. So, Everybody um, knows. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you all so much for. Oh, hold on. Wait, wait. One, 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 one. Just a quick take. Yeah. We had your take earlier on Medicare for all and uh, yeah. how hospitals and doctors feel about that. Could yeah. you do that in? Oh, sure. Yes. Super, super yes. briefly. Yes. Yeah. Good. So Medicare for all, which I've discussed, that's the direction we need to go in. Um, and, and again, as we were talking about with the steering committee, the exact pathway to get there 
is not as important to me as getting to the place where we have that kind of coverage for everyone, for all Americans, right? The reason I say it like that is because um, it may not be the Bernie bill, right? That's one way to do it, but there could be Tim Kaine. It took, there's a lot of other ways to to bring more people into a Medicare buy-in, or to to uh, to maybe with the Affordable Care Act put the public option there, right? There's other ways to make to to get to that point where everybody has basic Medicare medical care and basic coverage because I, that's an American value and I think it's a right. And so I, be, I just want to be real clear on that. Um, and with regard to some apparently. Folks are saying that uh, hospitals and, and doctors don't like um, the idea of Medicare for all or the idea for, that is absolutely false. And there are some that may not, but I know that many surveys have showed that removing the 70 or 80 individual private insurers, which causes such chaos with the, the physicians, staff, and, and, and folks working for the docs and hospitals, getting that away, just, yes, Medicare is a large bureaucracy but it is also a pretty darn efficient one. So having one versus 80, like these, the, the, stu the study I'm talking about from Wisconsin a few years back, m like two thirds of the physicians, Republicans, Democrats, all of it were like, bring it, let's do this. Because they just think about the kind of overhead they have because of the, you know, mm -hmm. and all the, to just sort through all the reimbursement stuff. So it is absolutely uh, not true that all doctors and hospitals don't want expansion of Medicare because it's a stable reimbursement source and I think it's really great for the people so okay. awesome okay We're, I'll talk to you individually after is that okay, okay. all right thank you all thank you. Thank you.